Aristotle, on one occasion, was asked, to what extent are educated men superior to those uneducated? As much, he said, as the living are to the dead. Well, Americans apparently share the Greek sages' viewpoint, for we have erected the most elaborate and costly school system the world has ever known. Unfortunately, the system isn't working. American public education is in serious trouble Headlines about this growing problem in both the professional educational journals and the general news media are not difficult to find. News stories documenting the scholastic decline and social deterioration of our schools have become so commonplace that many Americans are no longer alarmed by them. In April of 1983, a special report sponsored by the federal government entitled A Nation at Risk did receive considerable nationwide coverage. The report began on a rather ominous and sobering note. It said, our nation is at risk. Our once unchallenged preeminence in commerce, industry, science, and technological innovation is being overtaken by competitors throughout the world. The educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation and a people. What was unimaginable a generation ago has begun to occur. Others are matching and surpassing our educational attainments. If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we have allowed this to happen to ourselves. We have, in effect, been committing an act of unthinking, unilateral, educational disarmament. Well, these dire warnings sound like the predictions which traditionally have come from conservatives, but this statement was written by political liberals. A nation at risk was the product of an 18-month study of the quality of education in the United States, conducted by the National Commission on Excellence in Education. The commission was created in August 1981 by then Secretary of Education, Terrell H. Bell. And its 18 members represented a bipartisan cross-section of America's education establishment. Now here are just a few of what the commission labeled indicators of the risk, which led them to such a bleak assessment of America's public education system. International comparisons of student achievement completed a decade ago reveal that on 19 academic tests, American students were never first or second, and in comparison with other industrialized nations, were last seven times. Some 23 million American adults are functionally illiterate. By the simplest tests of everyday reading, writing, and comprehension, about 13% of all 17-year-olds in the United States can be considered functionally illiterate. Functional illiteracy among minority youth may run as high as 40%. The College Board Scholastic Aptitude Test, called the SAT or SAT test, demonstrate a virtually unbroken decline from 1963 to 1980. Average verbal scores fell over 50 points, and average mathematics scores dropped nearly 40 points. Between 1975 and 1980, Remedial mathematics courses in public four-year colleges increased by 72% and now constitute one quarter of all mathematics courses taught in those institutions. The Department of the Navy reported to the commission that one quarter of its recent recruits cannot read at the ninth grade level, the minimum needed simply to understand written safety instructions. Now, since the publication of A Nation at Risk, Many other studies have cataloged further reasons for concern over academic decline. Geography as a distinct subject has virtually disappeared from the public schools during the past several decades. In 1965, the Association of American Geographers warned of the prevailing geographical illiteracy and sensibly observed, for the United States to cope successfully with its own domestic problems and to participate effectively in world affairs, its leaders and citizens must have a coherent understanding of the Earth's regions and peoples. Now, several important studies indicate that
that the geographical knowledge of today's students is anything but coherent. A test on geography administered to 12-year-olds by the Dallas Times-Herald revealed that among one group of students tested, more than 20% couldn't even find the United States on a world map, and another 20% identified Brazil as the United States. Well, college students didn't fare much better. 95% of university students in North Carolina who took a basic geography test flunked it. A nationwide test administered to 17 and 18 year olds by the Gallup organization a few years earlier yielded many interesting answers. Among them, Mexico and Canada were the last two states admitted to the United States. The Sinai Desert is in Vietnam. Angola is in the Philippines. French and Latin are the most prevalent languages in Latin America. Well, contrast this glaring ignorance with some sample questions from a high school entrance examination given in the United States in 1875. Name the countries of Europe, Asia, and Africa that touch upon the Mediterranean Sea. And name the states of the Union bordering on the Atlantic, on the Gulf of Mexico, on the Pacific, and on the Great Lakes. In mathematics, international comparisons show that the United States has fallen to such an extent that we're barely competing with the world's lesser developed countries. In January 1987, the International Association for the Evaluation of Education Achievement published this report, The Underachieving Curriculum, Assessing U.S. Mathematics from an International Perspective. According to this comprehensive assessment, in school mathematics, the United States is an underachieving nation, and our curriculum is helping to create a nation of underachievers. These graphs from the study tell a grim story. In geometry, measurement, algebra, and calculus, U.S. students ranked near the very bottom in comparison with students from other countries. When it comes to teaching communication skills, writing and speaking, it appears that our schools have become new towers of Babel. Many students seem to be completely ignorant of the basic rules of grammar, punctuation, syntax, and spelling, and are capable of only the most primitive speech and writing. In 1986, the National Assessment of Education Progress issued a report entitled The Writing Report Card, Writing Achievement in American Schools. The study evaluated some 55,000 students nationwide on four different writing tasks, analytic writing, persuasive writing, informative writing, and stories. The NAEP authors wrote that pervasively weak writing performance revealed serious shortcomings in critical thinking and communication by American youngsters. The researchers came to these conclusions. Although America's youth can write at a minimal level, they cannot express themselves sufficiently well to make themselves understood. And that most American students, majority and minority alike, are unable to write adequately except on the simplest of tasks, despite a recent national focus on writing instruction in schools. In the persuasive writing category, the report noted that most of the students at each grade level wrote letters of amazingly poor quality, similar to the following example, which we reproduce exactly as given by the NAEP. Another rule I don't like is the cafeteria rule, that if there is something under your feet, you have to pick it up. And I think that is sick, because sometimes that stuff is not yours, and it's been stepped on or off of. Then Mr. Russell walks over and tells you to go through it away, and if you refuss, he makes you sit at the penalty table. Well, when it comes to the subject of American history and our constitutional system of government, the level of understanding is equally abysmal. Essential facts, concepts, and themes about our heritage simply are not being taught, nor apparently does the civics instruction in school inspire our young people to participate in and feel a strong commitment and allegiance to our political system. In the 1986 elections, only 7% of the 18 to 24-year-olds bothered to vote. A nationwide survey of over a 1,000 Americans 
conducted in 1986 by the Hearst Corporation, even found some very serious gaps in the general public's knowledge of our Constitution. According to the Hearst poll, 46% of Americans do not know that the purpose of the original Constitution was to create a federal government and define its powers. 26% believe the Constitution's purpose was to declare independence from England. And 10% believe it was intended to create the original 13 states. A majority of the American public, 59%, does not know what the Bill of Rights is. Only 41% correctly identify it as the first 10 amendments to the original Constitution. 27% say the Bill of Rights is the preamble to the Constitution. Nearly half the public, 49%, erroneously think the President can suspend the Constitution. Nearly half of the American people, 45%, believe that the Marxist phrase, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, is in the Constitution. Three quarters of those surveyed are under the misconception that the Constitution guarantees every citizen the right to a free public education. The philosopher Aristotle, more than two millennia ago, observed that all who have meditated on the art of governing mankind are convinced that the fate of empires depends on the education of youth. Can anyone be optimistic about America's fate if our education system continues to produce such widespread ignorance? According to the Coalition for Literacy, a five-year-old government private sector alliance, Adult illiteracy costs the nation about $237 billion annually in lost industrial productivity, tax revenues, welfare support, crime, remedial education, and unemployment benefits. Private industry alone spends at least $25 billion per year on remedial education. It's become necessary for businessmen to teach their employees the basic academic skills that should have been acquired in elementary school. We have thus far touched only on the matter of academic decline in our public education crisis. But as serious as this side of the problem is, the situation becomes even more grave when we survey the social, moral, and spiritual decay of our schools. Crime, drugs, and violence are serious problems in most government schools today. Murder, rape, robbery, extortion, theft, burglary, arson, and vandalism are no longer problems found only in the inner city school. Uniformed guards and undercover officers patrol many schools. Metal detectors have been installed at school entrances in an attempt to keep guns, knives, and other deadly weapons out of the classroom. In 1975, the United States Senate Committee on the Judiciary published a report entitled Our Nation's Schools, a report card, A in school violence and vandalism. Citing numerous statistics on the criminal activity and mayhem in the public schools, the Senate report concluded that the level of violence and vandalism is reaching crisis proportions, which seriously threaten the ability of our educational system to carry out its primary functions. In 1978, the National Institute of Education released its Violent School Safe Schools study which still remains the most extensive survey on school disorders. As it made unmistakably clear, our schools are anything but safe. Each month, three million high school students are victims of crimes in school. And that includes two and a half million robberies and thefts. 282,000 students are assaulted in school every month. Each month, there are 2,400 acts of arson in schools. At least 125,000 teachers are threatened with physical violence each month. 1,000 teachers a month are assaulted badly enough to require medical care. Risks of assault and robbery to urban students are greater in school than outside. Half a million high school students say they're afraid in school most of the time. Almost 8% of urban junior and senior high school students miss at least one day of school per month because they're afraid of violence in schools. High school students are subjected to 525,000 attacks, shakedowns, and robberies every month. 
Well, several studies completed since that time indicate, if anything, that the situation is probably worse today. Most recently, a national practicum on schoolyard bullies held in May of 1987 at Harvard University warned of the seriousness of teen terrorism in the public schools. Among the conclusions of the practicum participants, as published in the journal School Safety, were these. One, school bullying is a significant and pervasive problem, and two, fear and suffering are becoming a way of life for victims of bullying. Now, there are still more dangers. The concern over teen pregnancy and AIDS is being exploited to promote sex education programs in the schools, many of which condone and even encourage premarital sex, homosexuality, and other sexual experimentation. In this video, Sex, Drugs, and AIDS, which is used in many junior and senior high schools, actress Ray Don Chong urges youngsters to use condoms when engaging in homosexual or heterosexual intercourse. The overall message of this award-winning film is that premarital sex is cool, even expected of adolescents. But smart, hip teens will play it safe by using condoms. Acceptance of homosexuality as an alternative lifestyle is promoted in a particularly heavy-handed manner, using an emotional interview with a young man whose homosexual kid brother is dying of AIDS. The zeal with which condoms are being promoted in our schools has reached an incredible stage. These are some of the materials being distributed to our children. We've censored the most graphic and obscene material. Condom Sense, a pornographic tabloid promoting what it calls the joys of condom sex, is being used today in many schools. Straight talk about sex and AIDS features dancing condoms, conveying a party attitude concerning sex, and giving the impression that sexual promiscuity is an acceptable norm. Can We Talk, produced by the Harvey Milk Lesbian and Gay Democratic Club, is openly pornographic and obscene in its language. In some schools, condoms are actually passed out to the students, and female students are required to apply them on the fingers of male students. The alarmingly high incidence of teen suicide in recent years has caused some parents to focus attention on another insidious influence in our schools, death education. Many parents are just beginning to realize that their children have been subjected to extremely morbid classes and assignments on death, dying, suicide, and other related topics. This subject has been introduced from the earliest grades through high school. There's good reason to believe that it's a significant contributing factor in the high national teen suicide rate. Many researchers have documented blatant ideological biases prevalent in textbooks that present a grossly distorted negative perception of America and the world. Through their textbooks, millions of children are subjected to a steady barrage of disinformation and propaganda on nuclear war, disarmament, pacifism, overpopulation, Marxism, feminism, environmental extremism, abortion, and a host of other issues. The sinister influence of secular humanism, values clarification, and moral relativism undermine students' religious convictions and respect for parental authority. In his book, Censorship, Evidence of Bias in Our Children's Textbooks, New York University psychology professor Dr. Paul C. Witz documents the censorship of historical Christian contributions in today's school texts. When mention of God or Christianity is made, it's likely to be in a negative context, and often in the form of profanity. On the other hand, voodoo, sorcery, shamanism, and other forms of occultism increasingly receive extensive and favorable coverage in textbooks and curriculum materials. Nuclear education, peace education, and global education programs widely used in the schools today tend to terrorize children with visions of apocalyptic nuclear holocaust. Even while promoting the idea that the Soviet and American systems of government are morally equivalent. Well, there is much, much more happening in public education today that should be of concern to every American. But our survey thus far can leave no doubt that we are indeed 
a nation at risk. The millions of children attending our government schools are at risk. They are at risk academically, physically, morally, and spiritually. It's unconscionable that we not only allow such conditions in these tax-supported institutions, but it is even worse when we continue sending the most vulnerable members of our society, our children, into these dangerous and corruptive environs. Even Dr. John I. Goodlad, one of the leaders of the liberal educational establishment, has given a very dark assessment of our present situation. Our public schools are collapsing, he said, and they threaten to bring about the collapse of our entire nation and civilization. Now, ordinarily, we would find little ground for agreement with Dr. Goodlad, but in this case, we must endorse his grim evaluation. Well, how do we account for this devastating decline in American academic achievement and the frightening social deterioration of our schools? What is the way out of this morass? The most common refrain that we hear from the educational establishment is that we're simply not spending enough on education and that the way out of our predicament must be paved with ever larger expenditures of tax dollars. Well, this is patently false. According to the U.S. Department of Education, between 1960 and 1980, spending on education by all levels of government rose by 163% adjusted for inflation. Over the same period, scholastic achievement test scores dropped by some 90 points. Public schools now spend an average of over $4,000 per student per year, more than any other country in the world yet countries that spend far less are surpassing us. Private schools with only half or less than half of the per pupil expenditures of the public schools are producing excellent results. No, the answer is not more money and more taxes. Another common explanation for the deterioration is overcrowded classrooms. We're told that the solution to the education problem is more teachers, smaller class sizes, and lower student-to-teacher ratios. But there's little evidence to support these claims either. The student-teacher ratios have been decreasing every year for the past two decades. Classes have been getting smaller. Yet the school deterioration has continued. In addition, we see that in Japan and other countries that are scholastically outperforming us, the average class size is larger than ours. Among many other so-called solutions being offered by the current school reform movement, we find higher teacher salaries, merit pay, tougher teacher certification, competency testing for teachers, longer school days, longer school years, magnet schools, tougher course requirements, more homework assignments, and on and on. Conservative reformers want more discipline, a return to academic basics, vouchers, tuition tax credits, creationism courses, and a constitutional amendment to put prayer back in the public schools. Well, a few of these proposals have merit and should be pursued. However, even if it were politically possible to implement the best of these reforms, we would surely find them ultimately to be of little avail. We may affect some short-term improvements but will not avert the impending collapse to which Dr. Goodlad referred. What must be realized is that these reforms deal merely with symptoms. The real problem is systemic. The public school system itself, it is a political institution, and because it is, education has become hopelessly politicized. Education has become a political football for special interest groups political parties, and factions. Those with the greatest political power, influence, and organizational skill dictate the education policies for all. So it is that the powerful teachers' unions, the National Education Association, and American Federation of Teachers, have largely dictated the educational policies which have brought us to the current sorry state. Politics is subverting and destroying education. No amount of reform of the public school system will change this. The system itself is inherently political. 
It is an entity created, funded, and controlled by government. At one time, local governments largely controlled public education. But those times are long gone. Local control is a myth. The most important policy decisions in the field of education today are made in state capitals and in Washington, D.C., by politicians and bureaucrats who are more concerned about pleasing the professional education lobby than they are interested in the real needs of children and the desires and rights of parents. And the trend is toward continued centralization, leading ultimately to total control of education in the hands of the federal government. Now, how and when did this come about? Let's take a brief look at the history of education in America. It'll surely come as a shock to many, but government-sponsored, tax-supported public education as we know it today did not always exist in America. For the most part, education in the colonies and in the earlier years of our republic was carried out in an atmosphere of free choice and free enterprise. Tutors and private schools flourished. Churches, benevolent societies, and sometimes local governments established charity schools for children whose families couldn't afford schooling. Many parents schooled their children at home, and it was a system that worked exceptionally well. Remarking on America's early educational achievement, John Adams said in 1765, a native of America who cannot read or write is as rare an appearance as a comet or an earthquake. The 1840 census listed about 90% of white adults as literate. The 1860 census showed that 94% of free males were literate. Even if one takes into account that these figures may be somewhat inflated because of loose definitions of literate, it's still obvious that our early forebears were doing something right and that we could learn from them today. Educational historians are in agreement that one sign of the effectiveness of the many forms of education that existed in our young nation was that Americans were among the most literate people in the world. A perusal of the literature of that time is instructive. Take a look at the Federalist Papers. These essays by Hamilton, Madison, and Jay, intended for the common man, were first published in the newspapers and were widely read by the general population. Most college graduates today would find the Federalist Papers rough going. They would also find most of the political speeches, debates, and church sermons of a century or two ago to be equally humbling. Or take the McGuffey's fifth or sixth reader. Many college students today would find them a real challenge. The great minds that forged our remarkable constitutional system didn't have the supposed benefit of public schooling. George Washington, James Madison, Patrick Henry, John Quincy Adams, and many of our most illustrious leaders and intellectuals were educated primarily at home. Nine of our presidents received most of their schooling through home education. Abraham Lincoln said that the sum of all his formal education wouldn't equal one year. Yet on his own, as a young man, he mastered the six volumes of Euclid, read all of the Bible, studied Shakespeare, Gibbon, and Rowland's History of the World, and then launched into the study of law. Those early years of educational freedom were also the intellectual high water marks for our country. Liberty seems to have had a tremendously invigorating influence on men's minds. In 1817, the city of Boston appointed the famed architect Charles Bullfinch to head a committee that would survey the educational needs of the residents. The Bullfinch report revealed that 96% of the town's children were attending school, and the 4% who didn't had free charity schools available to them if they wished to go. Compare that 4% with today's dropout rate of 27% nationwide and over 40% in many large cities. The framers of our Constitution didn't make any mention of schools or education in that founding document. They didn't believe that involvement in education was a proper role for the federal government. So in writing the Constitution, 
they delegated no powers to the national government regarding education. And with the Tenth Amendment, they made it perfectly obvious that the federal government was not to meddle in this area and in many other areas as well. The Tenth Amendment states, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. So, education was left entirely up to the states or to the people. The people wisely recognized that the free market educational system they already had was performing quite well. They also recognized that there was no need for state or local government to be involved in education either. In the early 19th century, however, alien philosophies from Europe, among them various socialist ideologies, began to make inroads into American intellectual circles. In 1825, Robert Owen, often referred to as the father of socialism, came to America to establish his utopian commune at New Harmony in Indiana. His experiment in communal living was a dismal failure, as have been all experiments in communism or socialism throughout history. But Owen concluded that the failure of New Harmony was not an indication that his theories were faulty, but resulted from the faulty development of man. So he decided to devote his energies to changing man by changing his upbringing and education. Individuality and what he called the prejudice of religion, both of which were transmitted by parents, had to be rooted out. Owen and his disciples wanted to separate children from their parents at the earliest age possible. They wanted children raised in communal houses where all could be indoctrinated uniformly and molded into the new man for the new socialist society. Francis Wright, a radical feminist and one of Owen's most zealous apostles, helped lead the fight for the collectivization of children. She summed up the Owenite vision in these words. In these nurseries of a free nation, no inequality must be allowed to enter. Fed at a common board, clothed in a common garb, raised in the exercise of common duties, in the acquirement of the same knowledge and practice of the same industry, in the exercise of the same virtues, the enjoyment of the same pleasures, in the study of the same nature, in pursuit of the same object, their own and each other's happiness. Say, would not such a race, when arrived at manhood and womanhood, work out the reform of society, perfect the free institutions of America? Well, this frightful vision of monotonous, uniform, cookie-cutter children, automatons devoid of any individualism, is repugnant to free people, but it was enthusiastically embraced by the socialists and other would-be reformers who wished to play God. Indeed, the Owenites and their allies often spoke of their state school movement in messianic terms. They worshiped the state. Statism was their secular religion. This was nowhere more clearly expressed than in a statement by Frances Wright, where she called for national rational Republican education, free for all at the expense of all, conducted under the guardianship of the state at the expense of the state, for the honor, the happiness, the virtue, the salvation of the state. Well, naturally, there was opposition to these radical proposals, but the state school advocates were persistent and highly organized. They tempered their radical socialist and atheistic rhetoric and gradually gained support in political circles. In 1837, they succeeded in getting the Massachusetts legislature to establish a state board of education with Horace Mann as secretary. Gradually, Mann's powers grew, as did the power to tax for the support of state education. Horace Mann, who has become known as the father of public education, was a fervent evangelist for state-controlled schooling and he played an important role in its spread to other states. In 1848, the first copies of this document, the Communist Manifesto, appeared in Europe. In Section 2 of the Manifesto, Karl Marx outlined ten measures necessary to bring about a successful communist revolution in the advanced countries. Measure number 10 calls for free education for all children in public schools. Like Robert Owen, 
Marx understood the necessity for state control of the minds of the young in order to successfully establish a totalitarian state. And government-controlled education has become a cardinal feature of all modern totalitarianisms. The worldwide devastation and the massive human death toll and atrocities brought about in this century by Nazism, fascism, and communism were to a large degree made possible by the indoctrination of youth in government schools. So it's quite remarkable that state-sponsored public education, which was so vigorously opposed by our nation's early patriotic and religious leaders, and which was so alien to our American political and economic system, should now be looked upon as a vital element of our heritage that supposedly is indispensable for our national survival. It's not uncommon to hear remarks such as, the public schools are what made America great, or to see posters like this one extolling the importance of public schools. 130 years ago, in 1857, an important event occurred that helped speed acceptance of government education and helped establish it as a sacred idol before which all Americans now must genuflect. In that year, the National Education Association, the NEA, was founded. Its primary purpose was to overcome opposition to state education. The NEA set about to undermine support for private education by portraying it as elitist, aristocratic, and undemocratic. At the NEA's very first organizational meeting in Philadelphia in 1857, the call was made for a centralized Federal Department of Education. In support of this goal, which was finally accomplished in 1979, the NEA has labored over a century to consolidate school districts and to concentrate and centralize school policy-making power at the state level. It helped pass compulsory attendance laws and certification requirements in order to undermine parents' control over their children and to squeeze church schools and other independent educational institutions out of existence. Now, as the nation's largest labor union with 1.7 million members, the NEA pours millions of dollars into political campaigns to help bring about expanded federal control over all education. Author Samuel L. Blumenfeld has rightly identified the NEA as a Trojan horse in American education. Following in the footsteps of Francis Wright, the NEA and its political allies are working to gain control over our children at even younger ages by supporting legislation to make kindergarten attendance mandatory for five-year-olds. And there are strong movements now to mandate preschool attendance for three- and four-year-olds. Education is the largest single enterprise in America today. It's the primary activity of over 60 million Americans. This includes over 57 million students in our elementary and secondary schools and colleges, and over 3.5 million teachers, principals, supervisors, and instructional staff. This means that more than one out of every four Americans is directly involved in education as a primary activity. As a nation, we are spending in the neighborhood of $280 billion annually on education. And apart from national defense, public education represents the largest single tax-based system of cash flow in this country. It is also the largest socialist institution and the most pervasive socialist influence in this country. Now that may sound at first like an extreme appraisal, but when the facts are considered objectively, it's merely a statement of reality. Consider, every weekday, from at least September to mid-June, millions of American youngsters get on government buses that take them to government schools. Many even receive a breakfast provided by the government. Then the teacher, who is trained, certified, and employed by the government, asks them to open their government-provided textbooks. At noon, the government supplies millions with a hot lunch and milk. The state provides them with toys, recreational equipment, sports programs, and entertainment. Government nurses immunize them, and in many schools, clinics are now being established for expanded health and medical services. Some of those services 
include distributing condoms and providing contraceptive and abortion counseling, often without parental knowledge or consent. After school, many youngsters go to government daycare centers or to government youth clubs until their parents get home from work. Following graduation from high school, most of those who go on to higher education attend tax-supported state institutions, and many will pay their tuition with government grants or loans subsidized by the government. And then, after college graduation, after 16, 17, or 18 years or more of exposure to state education, where they've been taught to look to government for every need, then we expect them to enter, embrace, and function in the American free enterprise system. Well, folks, it's not working. By its very nature, public education molds and trains youth to view government as a benevolent provider, rather than to see it as our founding fathers did, a dangerous servant and a fearful master over which one must maintain eternal vigilance. In his famous treatise on liberty, written in 1859, English philosopher John Stuart Mill saw the dangers all too clearly. A general state education, he wrote, is a mere contrivance for molding people to be exactly like one another, and as the mold in which it casts them is that which pleases the predominant power in the government, it establishes a despotism over the mind, leading by natural tendency to one over the body. Well, America is certainly well on its way toward establishing a firm despotism over both mind and body. This is nowhere more plainly evident than in the government abuse of parents who have merely sought to provide an education for their children outside of the state-controlled system. Across the country, parents and ministers are being jailed for the so-called crime of teaching their children at home or operating schools that don't submit to state dictates. The case of the Shippey families of New Plymouth, Idaho is a prime example of despotic government in action. It involved three brothers, Samuel, Robert, and Floyd Shippey, and their wives. These respected members of their community were arrested on Thanksgiving Day, 1984, and jailed for 21 days. Their crime? They had taken their children out of the public schools in order to teach them at home in accordance with their religious convictions. Robert and Floyd finally submitted their families to the state's mandates. Sam and Marquita Shippey refused. And six of their school-aged children were forcibly removed from the family home and placed in a state-run facility. These photographs by Larry Hoffman of the Daily Argus Observer in Ontario, Oregon, show the anguish of a loving mother and father as their children are forcibly taken from them. But they also speak volumes about the injustice and the wrong-headedness of laws and policies and totalitarian thinking that bring about such scenes. Now reunited with their children, Sam and Marquita have fled across state lines to avoid any further family separation. There was never even any suggestion that the Shippey children were being abused by their parents or that their home instruction was inadequate. The presiding judge conceded that he didn't know of a finer, more upstanding, honest, productive family in the community. The district attorney admitted that the Shippey children were good and obedient. It was simply a case of government officials refusing to tolerate a parental challenge to state control over the children. In March 1987, the Reverend Tot M. Taylor and his wife Sharon of Mount Pleasant, Iowa, were jailed for teaching their children, Nicholas 8 and Stephanie 13, in their own Bluebird Christian School at the First Assembly of God Church. The Taylor's school is non-approved by the state of Iowa. The Taylors, however, like many other Christians across America, chose not to submit to state certification. To do so, they believe, would be to invite state authorities to exercise control over their religious beliefs. State certification brings state regulation, and then state rules regarding teacher training, hiring, curriculum, textbooks, record keeping, disciplinary measures, and other matters. The Taylors and many others believe that to accept such state control would make independent schools no better than or different from the government schools that they have rejected. Unfortunately, K-12 
Cases like those of the Shippies and the Taylors may have frightened some parents away from educating their children outside of the state-controlled schools. On the other hand, these outrageous incidents and others like them have sparked huge rallies across the country and have drawn public attention to the gross injustice that is being perpetrated in the name of education and the public welfare. In a number of states, these incidents have resulted in public outcries that have brought much needed changes in the school attendance laws. They have also resulted in home school and private school forces organizing politically and developing sophisticated and aggressive legal representation to challenge dictatorial laws and policies. It should be evident that parents who go the extra mile, who take on the added financial burden, and who are willing to commit their time to private schooling or homeschooling, are exceptionally responsible and conscientious parents. Many of them do this at great personal sacrifice because they love their children and want what is best for them. They should be commended and encouraged, not hectored, threatened, prosecuted, and imprisoned. And this brings us to the most fundamental issue involved in all of the educational reform debate, though it is an issue that is seldom mentioned. It is, who shall have control of the children, parents or the state? Who shall determine what constitutes proper education? The fathers and mothers who raise, nurture, shelter, and love their children? Or the politicians and the government bureaucrats? English common law, which is the basis of much of our legal heritage, and American case law through the 1800s, both firmly acknowledge parents' authority and liberty in selecting their child's education. This recognition of the primacy of the family continued even into the early 1900s. In the landmark 1925 case of Pierce versus Society of Sisters, the United States Supreme Court overturned an Oregon state law that had established a public education monopoly and had outlawed private and religious schools. The Supreme Court held that the law unreasonably interferes with the liberty of parents and guardians to direct the upbringing and education of children under their control. The fundamental theory of liberty upon which all governments in this union repose excludes any general power of the state to standardize its children by forcing them to accept instruction from public teachers only. The child is not the mere creature of the state. Those who nurture him and direct his destiny have the right, coupled with the high duty, to recognize and prepare him for additional obligations. During the past half century, the courts have departed from their strict defense of parents' rights, but have nonetheless tended to favor the parents over the state in most cases. In the important Wisconsin versus Yoder case, in 1972, the Supreme Court reaffirmed the earlier Pierce ruling and overturned a state compulsory education statute as it applied to the Amish religious community. In the Yoder decision, the court said, this case involves the fundamental interest of parents as contrasted with that of the state to guide the religious future and education of their children. This primary role of the parents in the upbringing of their children is now established beyond debate as an enduring American tradition. Case law and common sense both tell us that the state must demonstrate a compelling interest to justify overriding parental rights. Yet advocates of statist schooling insist that compulsion and massive regulation are absolutely essential to proper education. Thomas Jefferson squarely rejected this notion, saying, it is better to tolerate the rare instance of a parent refusing to let his child be educated than to shock the common feelings and ideas by forcible asportation and education of the infant against the will of the father. But Mr. Jefferson's observation is no less applicable today, even though several generations of public schooling may have dulled the sense of parental responsibility that prevailed in earlier times Parents who would completely neglect their children's education are still quite rare. And it certainly doesn't make sense to penalize the many conscientious parents for the dubious purpose of correcting a negligent few. Looking at this matter from a related but different angle, even if the government school system 
flawlessly produced only perfect geniuses with strong character traits, it would still violate the precepts on which our political institutions are founded if it were empowered to compel parents to turn their children over to it. But in light of the disastrous condition of public education, which we have already outlined, it is even more obvious that there is no justification whatsoever for compelling attendance. The most incompetent parents couldn't possibly do a worse job than is being done typically in the public school today. In fact, all available evidence shows that parents who have rejected government schools are doing a superlative job. There are now an estimated one million children being educated at home in the United States. Another six million are attending private and church-related schools, and these numbers can be expected to continue growing as the state schools continue to deteriorate. So there's a large database for comparative research. In every academic category, student achievement in the private school and home school sector surpasses that of the public school students. Further, the private schools experience a small fraction of the disciplinary problems, disruptions, crime, violence, and vandalism of the state schools. Now, this is true even when the school populations are matched for ethnic, socioeconomic, and neighborhood characteristics. In their book, High School Achievement, Public, Catholic, and Private Schools Compared, published in 1982, authors James S. Coleman, professor of sociology at the University of Chicago, and Thomas Hoffer, research associate at Northern Illinois University, concluded that given the same type of student, that is, with background standardized, Private schools excel in all academic areas. School attendance is better. Students do more homework and take more rigorous courses. Interestingly, the study also found that the private schools were more successful at promoting the social objectives of equality and racial harmony that the state schools advocates pursue with such zeal. The Coleman-Hoffer report found that overall, blacks and whites are less segregated within Catholic schools than are blacks and whites in public schools, and that the non-Catholic private school sector is least racially segregated, and the public sector by far the most segregated. Furthermore, the private sector was far more successful in closing the academic achievement gap between students from advantaged and disadvantaged backgrounds. According to the 1982 study, Altogether, the evidence is strong that the Catholic schools function much closer to the American ideal of the common school, educating children from different backgrounds alike, than do the public schools. Finally, the authors wrote, the greatest difference found in any aspect of school functioning between public and private schools was the degree of discipline and order in the schools. Their 1987 book, Public and Private High Schools, confirms and extends their earlier findings. Catholic and private high school students are more likely to graduate, more likely to enroll in college, and more likely to stay in college once enrolled. Finally, a U.S. Department of Education study issued in 1986 has direct bearing on what we have just discussed. This report disclosed that proportionally American public school teachers send their children to private schools in far greater numbers than does the general public. The report's authors observed that when public school teachers send their children to private schools, it says something about the schools they teach in. And indeed it does. It says very pointedly that even those who are employed in the public school system and who therefore can be presumed to be more intimately familiar with that system are opting out of it in significant numbers. Now let's review a few of the key points we have covered. The right of parents to educate their children as they see fit is a fundamental God-given right, long established in our American heritage and our English common law tradition. Historically, the system of parental free choice in education was fully accepted in the early era of our republic it produced the amazing levels of educational achievement that brought us prosperity and world renown. Side-by-side -side comparisons of government schools and private schools today continue to confirm the wisdom of the educational philosophy of our forebears. Compulsory state schooling is a foreign concept 
incompatible with free American institutions and personal liberty. Since its importation into America in the 19th century, it has seriously undermined parental rights, parental responsibility, family unity, and political liberty. Public education today is an academic, social, moral, and economic disaster. And this has placed our children and our nation at risk. Immediate drastic change is imperative if we are to avert calamity. Here is what we recommend. Government should support parental rights, encourage parental responsibility, and restore freedom of choice in education in the following ways. One, repeal obstacles to the use of non-government education, such as compulsory attendance laws and teacher certification requirements for home schools and private schools. Two, remove unfair tax burdens. Parents who don't use the state school system shouldn't be taxed to support it. They're being forced to pay twice for their children's schooling, which works a severe hardship on many. And this has the greatest adverse impact on the economically disadvantaged families who have the most to gain from private education. Three, abolish the U.S. Department of Education and remove all federal involvement in education. There is no constitutional basis for this involvement and the impact of the federal government's policies, programs, and actions thus far have been disastrous. Now, these are simple recommendations, but they'll do more to restore excellence in education than all the complex reform proposals being offered today by political interest groups. The many reform proposals currently receiving great attention are invariably accompanied by ridiculous promises and high-flown rhetoric about innovative, courageous leadership. In reality, they offer nothing bold, imaginative, or new. Ultimately, they're based on the same coercions, compulsions, and restrictions that have produced our present education fiasco. We, on the other hand, believe in liberty, responsibility, and accountability. Let those who want prayer in schools establish their schools, and those who do not want prayer establish theirs. Let those who wish to teach creationism have their schools, and those who want to teach evolution have theirs. Let those who want phonics instruction have their schools, and those who want look-say reading, let them have theirs. There's no need to make these personal educational decisions into political issues that inflame our institutions and tear communities apart. In matters of education, as in matters of religion, there is no justification for compulsion, no justification for state intervention. Neither is there justification for forcing anyone to finance educational theories and practices with which he is in disagreement. We believe it's time for getting politics out of education. It's time for the separation of school and state. We say, let's restore freedom in education. We have tried coercion, and it has failed. Can we really allow a situation to continue in which millions of our children are turned out as illiterates and intellectual cripples? A situation in which millions of our children live in fear and terror? Don't your children deserve better than that? Can we afford continued loss of our productivity and our markets to foreign countries? Can we afford the horrendous tax burden of maintaining the crumbling educational system? We think not. Let's welcome greater choice, diversity, and pluralism. Let's return to those liberating principles on which our nation was founded. Let's strive again for excellence and strive to recapture those values that have made America great and a beacon of hope to the world.